Hello again, and welcome to our fourth unit. This one I've entitled anyway, The Saints, the Puritans, and the Development of New England in the 17th Century. First, the word saints, not a reference to the football team of that same name, and not a reference to Catholic saints. Uh, there are many saints in the Catholic Church, but uh, the Puritans, or Protestants, uh, were Protestants, and their use of the word saint is somewhat different. Uh, saint uh, meant a full member of the church or church community. So we'll get into this more as we go along, but you could regularly attend church without being a full member, but the full members got sort of the perks, and you had to pass certain tests, not written tests, but certain judgments from the community, uh, pastors, ministers, the you know, the, uh, the the saints themselves, to become a saint. So saints uh, in a specifically Puritan sense of the word. I direct your attention to the bottom of the screen. Whether you knew it or not, in our last unit on 17th century Virginia, Jamestown, the main simple question that I was sort of focusing our attention on, unspoken at the time, was what did they do? So what did the Jamestown colonists do that was important in history? This time, uh, and this, uh, if you keep both of these in mind when you go back to study, hopefully you do go back to study these, that you'll see that if you focus in this unit uh, on a different question, also simple at least to say, or ask, who were they uh, on the, from, from the Puritans? Uh, uh, in New England, uh, it's more important, I think, to sort of uh, try to get out of them uh, who they were, what they stood for, what their values were, because that's where their, uh, I think, biggest influence uh, and significance uh, in American history is. Now, that's not to say that in Virginia they weren't religious at all. Uh, most of the Virginia colonists were good old-fashioned Anglicans. Anglican uh, is another way to say Church of England, which was the official Protestant church uh, of a more mild nature uh, in, in England. Uh, so there were plenty of Virginia colonists that were churchgoers uh, and uh, you know, believed thoroughly in all of the tenets of Christianity. Uh, but the, the religious uh, element in the community uh, in Jamestown, in Virginia, wasn't as big a part of the historical story uh, as it was for the Puritans to the north. And part of the reason, or the main reason for that, is that the Puritans, they were coming over uh, uh, to the New World in the first place, to settle in Massachusetts and New England, or Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, which is what New England was at the time. That's still part of New England today, of course. So we know the Virginia colonists were there primarily for economic uh, and other reasons and not religious ones. There were a few exceptions to that even then. But overwhelmingly, at least in the 17th century, uh, the colonists that kept arriving, let's say in Massachusetts, uh, were Puritans. Uh, so they, they came for specifically uh, and uh, you know, uh, broad general reasons uh, both uh, in a way that the Virginia colonists did not. So before we proceed uh, you know, further on, on this, uh, let me also kind of uh, set the table here. I believe the Puritans uh, have gotten a bad name, at least uh, amongst historians and scholars in the colleges and universities, and some of that is, I, I think, apt. Uh, it's, it's fair. There's a lot to criticize here. But uh, I think that, I told you, I think in the introductory <clears throat> welcome video that I did, that I seek uh, a balance uh, and I try to look at uh, things from many different perspectives. So we'll certainly see signs uh, or examples of the downside to the Puritans, and there's you know, plenty of downside. And it's a judgment call. Uh, maybe there's much more downside than upside. Uh, that certainly wouldn't be hard to demonstrate from the evidence, some of which I'm going to give to you or share with you, direct you to. Uh, but I, I do think there's another side here. The, Par the Puritans were not just a malign influence uh, in American society. Uh, they were also a positive influence uh, in many ways and did a lot of things well uh, for the time uh, and right uh, for the time. The trick is to sort of sort out, okay, did they do more 
harm than good, uh, vice versa. I'm not going to answer that question, partly because it's just a difficult one. We don't have time. I'm going to kind of introduce you to the question, give you some possible answers to the question uh, on multiple sides, uh, and you can uh, judge it however you feel uh, is uh, appropriate. Meet the Puritans, the Bible Commonwealths of New England. These uh, colonies, and the, they were more uh, uh, colonies uh, than there were later on. That's to say that there were two colonies in Massachusetts that by the end of the century combined into one, Plymouth Colony first, the famous one, Plymouth Rock, the first Thanksgiving, the Pilgrims, all that. And 10 years later, Massachusetts Bay Colony which built the city of Boston, among other things. But in 1691, they combined together to form uh, one colony, the colony of Massachusetts. And that's true in some of the other New England colonies as well. So there were actually several uh, Puritan colonies in New England to start with before they started to kind of amalgamate. Bible Commonwealth uh, is a, a phrase that, among other things, tells us that they were here primarily for religious reasons, uh, and they were trying to create societies that were built around uh, their religious beliefs uh, and their uh, version of Protestant Christianity. The Puritans were, and, and in a sense still were, members of the Anglican Church or Church of England, but they were dissenting members, meaning they, part of the reason, one of the main reasons, many of them, some of them stayed in England and Europe, came to the New World, came to Massachusetts and Rhode Island in the first place uh, was because they believed that their official church in England, Angl the Anglican Church, was getting it wrong, that they were too, it was too mild, uh, that their Christianity was too tepid. Uh, and so they were members, but they were members that were disillusioned uh, with the, the church policy, uh, church practice, church you know, uh, interpretation of the Bible, uh, uh, the theology, etc. So uh, they're extreme members of the Anglican Church believing that the Anglican Church uh, is sort of too middle of the road. It needed to, in their view, become sort of much more Protestant. Uh, some of the Puritans believe that the, the tepid sort of middle of the road, more mild approach of the Anglican Church was uh, still too much like Catholicism. Uh, and uh, as you probably already know, in this century and the one before uh, and ever after, the Protestants uh, you know, didn't think much uh, of the, the, the Catholics. I shouldn't say ever after, that's changed uh, now, uh, but for a long time, uh, right? Uh, Puritans uh, held Catholics uh, in contempt. This is certainly true of the Puritans. So we're asking the question, who are they? Who are the Puritans and what were they trying to accomplish? Uh, some historians have spoken of uh, a Puritan way, that they had their own sort of way of thinking, not just about religion, but about uh, their religious values infused their whole uh, you know, way of approaching life uh, and community and society. And some of uh, the historians on this do actually believe that Puritanism was a way of life, in a sense, kind of a subculture uh, within the larger English culture uh, of the time. Uh, some have called it a temperament, uh, and one uh, has said, a current historian, they strove to lead exemplary lives through godly communities uh, with an intense commitment to religion, life, uh, and, so and society. And they were pretty intense, as, as we'll see, uh, for, for good and bad. Uh, as uh, Francis Bremer, one of the current experts on Puritan history, says, Puritanism provided psychological certitude, which helped many to cope with and adapt to the changing circumstances of socioeconomic life. The Puritan faith offered a means by which uh, uh, he could explain, uh, or they could explain, the baffling changes that surrounded them. So, uh, in a sense, he's trying to explain the uh, sociological origins of Puritanism. Uh, uh, again, the Puritans are English Protestants, uh, members technically of the Anglican Church, but as we'll see as we go further here, uh, the Puritans were the English version of Calvinists on the European continent, uh, stemming from the work of John Calvin, the other uh, uh, of the you know, greatest uh, uh, leaders in the early Protestant Reformation of the previous century, along with Martin Luther. 
Calvin had his own sort of branch or version uh, of uh, sort of uh, reformed, uh, non-Catholic, uh, new brand of Christianity, it was new at the time anyway, uh, and his followers, uh, and he had a growing number of them in his lifetime and afterwards, uh, became uh, known as Calvinists. Uh, they take their name, of course, from him. So uh, it's about, I think, 98% true to say that the Puritans were simply the English version of Calvinists. Uh, more on that later. Professor Taylor, uh, uh, who I've quoted many times already, will continue to for a while, says, Puritans were incorrigible doers. A strict code of personal discipline and morality uh, was a big part of their lives and you know, uh, society, uh, which liberated people from a sense of helplessness by encouraging effort, persistence, study, and purpose. And I love the phrase, I think I use it again here, uh, incorrigible doers, uh, meaning they were a whirlwind of activity, both as individuals uh, and as a collectivity. So uh, this group really sought to get things done in all aspects uh, of, of their lives uh, and in their communities. Uh, and they often succeeded. Uh, so they're driven by a, a, a real uh, kind of inner energy which we'll explore as we go along. So the Bible Commonwealths uh, uh, meant that they were trying to create a whole social system consistent with God's will, so that uh, you know there's they're focusing on, of course, their church, uh, religious institutions, trying to make them, in their view, better than the ones that they had been left behind in England, the Church of England itself. But they also want to construct and create other institutions, political institutions, economic institutions, educational institutions that are consistent uh, with their view of what is God's will. So the whole uh, of, you know, Bible Commonwealth of, you know, Connecticut, say, was uh, uh, at least in theory built around the idea that the, the, the religion, the religious value system or religious beliefs and practices uh, come first and they help to dictate the way we uh, construct uh, the rest of our institutions and the rest of society. So uh, from here, from what I just said, you can see, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think more uh, more clearly than I said you know, at the outset, how much of this sort of experiment as it was, uh, sort of putting down roots in the new world, trying to find a place where they can carry out their religion, the Puritan brand, Calvinist brand, free of at least most uh, controls uh, and uh, influence and coercion uh, by England, its kings, its government, and the Church of England, which was more or less controlled by the government, uh, right, in, in peace and do things their way, the right way, set up Bible commonwealths. I implied in what I've just said is that the, the idea that they didn't think that England, uh, uh, you know, represented a Bible commonwealth because they didn't, number one, believe that England, the Church of England, was practicing religion the right way, uh, preaching uh, religion the right way, uh, but they also didn't believe that the institutions around it, again, government, uh, the economy, schools, uh, whatever else it may be, was consistent with God's will. So uh, the very fact that these colonies arose and arose the way they did was a rebuke to the, the England they left. Now, many of these people, most of them, were still proud English citizens at the time in most ways, but they did have a tendency to be rebels um, religiously uh, and in some ways uh, even otherwise, uh, as we'll see. The Bible commonwealths, the Puritan colonies in New England, they were successful more quickly uh, than their brethren further to the south in Virginia, uh, we've already looked at. And by the end of the 17th century, there were 133 plus towns. Uh, just the number of towns doesn't automatically bespeak of success, but it, it tends to. Uh, the, the point being, if you're not doing something right, how the heck did you get 133 towns spread out, uh, you know, throughout this uh, area in a you know a century or less? Uh, 
Uh, so uh, now that doesn't mean there weren't some nasty, uh, you know, uh, methods used to make all this happen. For instance, driving Native Americans off the land by force. That, of course, is true. Uh, but success, at least in the economic sense, in the sense of the Puritans are sort of creating societies that they want, that can thrive, uh, you know, even if it uh, means cruelty uh, to those they consider outsiders. Uh, and there's more than one group that fits in that category from their perspective. Uh, nonetheless, uh, they're successful uh, in, you know, on their own terms, uh, from their own perspective, and even to ours in certain ways, not necessarily morally. The first appointed governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, and we're going to spend most of our time talking about Massachusetts Bay Colony as kind of the example uh, of all the other Bible commonwealths around uh, it in the New England area. So it's the most important historically anyway, but I'm kind of using it here as just sort of our uh, example because we don't have time, of course, to go into every single Bible colony, uh, every single uh, you know New England uh, colony and sort of look at how they did Puritanism uh, and built the society slightly differently from place to place. So there's enough generalizations we can make that we can successfully uh, uh, accurately use Massachusetts Bay as the as the model. John Winthrop, then the appointed governor early on from the beginning uh, and for years and years afterwards, uh, he delivered a sermon, wrote a sermon, a model of Christian charity, as it's known, in 1630, uh, when the uh, Puritans first arrived at Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, he, he was a saint, meaning a full member of the church, as you probably expect the governor of a Puritan colony to be. Uh, but he wasn't a clergyman. He was a political leader. And we'll uh, see that clergymen and political leaders were not one and the same. They often cooperated, uh, but they weren't one and the same. In uh, Puritan and Calvinist practice, a, a saint, uh, but not a preacher, someone who was just a member of the church, could actually deliver a sermon. You didn't have to be the ordained minister of the church right, in the local community to make a sermon. You could do so, particularly if you're the governor of the colony. Uh, you probably get to do a sermon uh, no matter what. He said uh, in that uh, famous uh, 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 piece of writing. Now, we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of the world upon us. Uh, and this phrase has actually been used by presidents ever since. Uh, they're not always talk, not usually talking about Puritan New England, but they, the phrase has sort of stood the test of time. It is rather poetic. Uh, Winthrop was talented in many ways. But uh, what he meant at the time was that we're going to create these Bible commonwealths and they'll be so successful. We'll be so good at doing it because we know we've got it right. Uh, they were pretty confident in themselves, though at times they lost confidence and could get insecure, but they were confident that they were doing uh, not only religion right, but the society around it right. And the fact that I say around it tells you something. They put sort of religion at the center uh, and the rest of society is organized around religion. Uh, and uh, Christianity. So we shall be as a city upon a hill means uh, we're going to be sort of an experiment and uh, and will be such a shining success, uh, right, uh, that the rest of the world will look at us like, like a city, right? As a city, the word as means this is a metaphor. It's not saying it's an actual city, though they did build the city of Boston. This is a metaphorical statement saying we'll be like a city, you know, a bright shining city upon a hill, a beacon for the rest of the world to look at uh, and envy and emulate. Uh, particularly England will look eventually and say, look, wow, the Puritans, they left here. We, weren't, we would, didn't understand why they were so upset and took off. Uh, but now we see they've created a better society built around religion uh, than uh, you know, we could ever have done. Uh, we need to take some notes. So uh, the Puritans were putting a lot of pressure on themselves and taking themselves awfully seriously uh, from the moment uh, that Winthrop said, uh, we shall be as a city upon a hill. Now the idea, he just sort of put a poetic ring to an idea that was not just in his head, uh, but was already kind of a Puritan way of looking at the world. They took themselves so seriously they saw themselves as the chosen people of God. And uh, 
this belief tells us uh, quite a bit about who they were. Uh, right? We're trying to find out who uh, are they. So uh, I don't mean their names, of course. We're going to learn some names. We already have seen one, John Winthrop. But I mean, sort of what's different about this group? Uh, what makes them sort of unique? Say uh, we can just bounce them off uh, to do this. The Virginia colonists, uh, how are they different than the Virginia colonists? Uh, well, one of the ways is this. Uh, they believe themselves to be the chosen people of God. Uh, and, uh, and they basically literally meant that. <clears throat> now, they're not the first people in world history, uh, nor the first Christians or the last to see themselves as the sort of a, a you know group chosen by God. Uh, nonetheless, uh, they're you know one of those that took it the most seriously, uh, and this says a lot about uh, how they uh, viewed uh, the world and their communities. Uh, it's an arrogant statement, so there's an arrogance here, taking themselves quite seriously, uh, is you know is a sign of arrogance, or too seriously is a sign of arrogance. Uh, but there's also a lot of pressure on this, because since they believed God was sort of you know favoring them, God was expecting a lot out of them. Keep in mind the Christian God is a moral God, uh, and so uh, he expects moral behavior. So the Puritans uh, d didn't always love the idea that they were the chosen people. I mean, they believed they were the chosen people. Uh, so it, it was pressure. So they can be seen as arrogant. Uh, and they can also be seen as uh, uh, you know anxiety prone, uh, as I think they were uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, all of it surrounding this idea that we'll be a, as a city upon a hill uh, and we're the chosen people of God. They were constantly searching for signs of salvation, signs that they were, uh, you know, destined to get into heaven, both individually and collectively. There, there is uh, evidence that indicates that uh, some Puritans believed that entire towns uh, could be like entirely full of, you know, uh, damned, doomed sinners that are all going to go to hell. Uh, or, or the entire town has already already been determined uh, to go to heaven, uh, which will get us eventually to the idea of predestination. But let's save that. I'll put it on the uh, back burner for the moment. They had an ongoing introspective desire to be better people uh, and sort of uh, do better by other people and sort of in the world. So uh, the pure, and again, this is both individually and collectively baked into the value system that was passed down from, you know, uh, parents to children and from one generation to the next is this idea that you're supposed to always sort of uh, look into yourself, uh, uh, try to always sort of connect with God and what God wants uh, and try to improve and do better both for you uh, as a spiritual person, both you and you know, for you and your job, for you and your family, for you and the community. How can I sort of be better uh, in all of those areas of life? The more the kind of modern picture of a Puritan praying uh, with his wife uh, on the left, uh, I, I like the, you know, it's not a totally accurate representation. It's a more modern type of art, uh, unlike the, picture on the right, which is uh, from a long time ago, but it gives you a sense of the Puritans sort of in quiet contemplation, trying to sort of understand themselves, God, the world, what God expects, and how I can do better. Uh, just picture this guy with his head down thinking, how can I be a better person, uh, right? And maybe anxiety about it. If I'm not a better person, uh, I'm not a good person, uh, uh, maybe I'm going to hell. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, intended, taught, uh, uh, you know, sort of cultural, uh, introspective, uh, you know, uh, anxiety uh, in these people, the Puritans. Incorrigible doers, uh, again, from that introspection, you get great effort, great energy, often successful uh, in multiple ways, as we'll see. I ask here, did the Scarlet Letter get it right? which is probably a terrible question to ask because hardly anyone these days has read the Scarlet Letter. When I was in college and high school, which tells you it was a long, long time ago, sadly, I don't recommend aging, by the way, 
the only thing is it's better than the alternative. So uh, I'm kind of stuck with it. Uh, but the Scarlet Letter uh, used to be read in basically all uh, high schools in English. Uh, one of the great uh, American authors, uh, literary figures of the 19th century, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, one of the great writers in American history, this is his most famous piece of writing. And it's, it's fictional, but it does take place in 17th century Puritan New England. Uh, and Hawthorne wasn't writing a, an historical novel, really. Uh, he uses the Puritans uh, to explore sort of larger human themes about guilt and shame and uh, 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 you know, th this kind of thing. So they're universal aspects of human nature that he's trying to, uh, he believes are you know, universal, that he's trying to sort of get at through uh, Puritan characters. Nonetheless, it does paint a certain picture of Puritan life. And it paints one that seems to uh, indicate the Puritans were really harsh folks. Uh, and so I direct your attention to the left of the screen, common words used not so much in the Scarlet Letter, well, some of these might have been in there, it's been a long time since I read it, uh, to describe the Puritans, uh, you know, ever since, especially now, uh, self-righteous. All of these things, by the way, or at least most of them, are somewhat true, uh, but debatable, like how true. Self-righteous, okay, intolerant, uh, they've been called zealots, fanatics, bigots, prudes, they've been called rigid, uh, overly strict, too severe, uh, austere, uh, which means sort of living a severe kind of scaled uh, down simple lifestyle, uh, uptight, uh, tyrannical, authoritarian, kind of hardcore uh, sort of religion, you know, uh, inflexible, uh, you know, uh, just just too too rigid. Uh, all of those things sort of get uh, get said about the Puritans, and there's some truth to it, uh, as I said. Uh, so, uh, were the Puritans cruel and intolerant, uh, or were they successful and praiseworthy? And the answer, uh, in my view, which is so often true in history, is yes and no. That was Ronald Reagan's old uh, uh, answer. Well, yes and no. Uh, right? It's a good sort of politician's uh, way of kind of trying to cover all ground. Uh, but it's not. I'm not saying it's always true. Uh, with regard to historical questions, but since they tend to be interpretive questions, uh, you can usually argue a yes and no side. And I often think, again, often, uh, not always, the, the truth is sort of in the middle between yes and no. Uh, so when you answered such a question, yes and no, it seems like you're copying out. That's the way we kind of see it in the modern world. But uh, it has the benefit uh, in historical study anyway, of often being, I think, right, or as close to right as you get. You're kind of playing it somewhat safe and saying, well, it could be this, or it could be that. Let's split the let's split the difference. And I think you're often on the right track. I I extreme answers in history, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not saying they're never right, but they tend, I think, to, to not be uh, as accurate. Reality the world, societies, uh, you know, in, in history or now, are too complex to sort of either just say, well, yes, uh, 100%, uh, or no, 100%. Uh, it doesn't usually work that way. Uh, it's just too complex. Too many variables, too many factors. On the other side, right, uh, I could use the words in the left, cruel uh, and intolerant uh, as among them, uh, but on the other side, successful and praiseworthy, uh, uh, I think a strong argument can be made for that uh, and is made by it by many uh, scholars. Scholars who are experts in the Puritans tend to see them in a more positive light, but not always than uh, most that study them, like us. Uh, as Edmund Morgan said, one of the great historians on this time period and place in American history, uh, contrary to popular impression, the Puritan was no ascetic. We'll come back to the word ascetic. If he continually warned against the vanity of the creatures as misused by fallen man, he never praised hair shirts or dry crusts. He liked good food, good drink, and homely comforts. And while he laughed at mosquitoes, he found it a real hardship to drink water when the beer ran out. It's a fancy way. I won't unpack all that for you. We don't need to. But it's a fancy way to say the Puritans were basically just like us. 
they liked comforts. They liked to eat good food and you know drink beer uh, and have a good time, just in moderation. There, there's no doubt that the Puritan value system was all about moderation, uh, trying to cut down excess and trying to you know avoid sin. But they didn't see having a good time or having you know a, a couple of beers as a sin. So we do tend, I think, to this is where I said. We can uh, that the universities and colleges, I think, sometimes give us a skewed perspective because they, in my view, textbooks as well, oftentimes not ours, but focus almost exclusively on the words on the left side of the screen uh, and don't come from the perspective of Edmund Morgan here. It's true that the Puritan uh, is uh, was no ascetic. Uh, an ascetic uh, uh, or an ascetic lifestyle is someone uh, or living a lifestyle that's sort of devoid of uh, too many uh, you know material things, uh, too many material pleasures. So uh, a, a monk lives an ascetic lifestyle in whatever religion that is, right? They live a simple life, not too many, you know, they don't have too many things. They don't buy things. They uh, live a simple uh, life, uh, you know, praying, working, you know, it's etc. Et uh, and the Puritans are, are surprisingly not ascetic, uh, since it's true that historically, uh, oftentimes the groups, uh, religious groups, in whatever religion that are most, you know, uh, dead serious about their religion, sort of put the most. Uh, time and you know, uh, pour uh, you know more of their lives uh, into the religion than other groups. They tend to have at least some members that are uh, ascetic, that kind of form uh, uh, you know uh, monasteries or sort of monk-like uh, uh, behavior. Uh, but the the Puritans didn't. Uh, they had a, a combination of uh, you know very very serious religious views. They believed literally in heaven and hell. Uh, and uh, uh, took all of that seriously, but uh, uh, were very active in this world. Many ascetic people, uh, let's say like Catholic uh, monks or Buddhist monks, uh, uh, many uh, such uh, people who are also uh, seriously religious, they tend to not focus on this world. They tend to focus on the other world, the afterlife, uh, preparing for the afterlife uh, after uh, uh, death. Uh, and so they're not as concerned with uh, living comfortably uh, in, in, you know, in the in the real world of the here and now. The Puritans weren't like that. They were very religious, but they thought getting into heaven uh, was very much caught up with uh, uh, being successful and being actively successful, working to be successful in the real world. That helped you to, uh, uh, you know, get into heaven or know you were going to know that you were getting into heaven. John Winthrop already mentioned the first governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, I call him the Puritan's Puritan. He's in some ways the definitional Puritan, other than the fact that he was the governor, since by definition people aren't usually the governors of entire colonies or uh, you know, uh, entire societies. Uh, his background was uh, gentry, so came from a rich uh, uh, background, the kind of hoity-toity types we saw in Virginia. So some of those guys are coming here too, just they're Puritans. Uh, he was well-educated, uh, uh, a lawyer. Uh, most of the uh, clergy uh, in New England, Puritan clergy uh, and uh, political leaders uh, were actually very well educated and often in the law. He uh, grew up in a Puritan stronghold in New England, became more devoted to Christianity uh, and you know, Puritanism over the years. He held the post of Governor of Massachusetts Bay off and on uh, for most of his remaining life after he uh, made the migration along with uh, you know the others that started the colony uh, and thousands uh, you know, flocked uh, following he and the early earliest colonists in ongoing debates and these were ongoing over the proper role of government uh, in these bible commonwealths he tended to take the side of more authority uh, than uh, more authority than freedom uh, the puritans uh, were on kind of the cutting edge uh, in, at least in western history of sort of looking at the relationship between the need for authority on one side and the need for freedom or liberty on the other side. 
uh, the concept of ordered liberty. Uh, there are books on ordered liberty, uh, but the Puritans were exploring this, you know, a, a hundred uh, uh, you know, plus years before our founding fathers did uh, on the eve of the American Revolution and after. So uh, there was a contribution here that was, you know, kind of picked up uh, or continued uh, uh, into the next century. It's not it's not surprising uh, that he took the side of sort of authority over freedom. Again, it's not a hundred percent or zero percent thing here. It's a good example of things aren't just yes or no usually in history. So when I say he took the side of more authority than freedom, I, I said more. Uh, I didn't just say authority. Uh, it's not an either or uh, here. Uh, the debate is: uh, should authority be sort of more important, uh, or should freedom be more important, or should it be fifty fifty? He tended to argue, well, freedom is important, but uh, we got to lean, I think, an air on the side of authority. Uh, when push comes to shove, if we don't have authority, society will break down and freedom will be meaningless anyway. That's sort of the standard argument made by uh, people that are grappling with this question, if they're on the authority side of it. Uh, so uh, he was kind of a moderate politically, uh, although he's not always seen that way. Uh, I think a moderate religiously as well. Also not always seen that way by other professors and scholars. I could be wrong, uh, but uh, it's the way I read it. Uh, I think he, he was a moderate. Often tried to find uh, compromises between warring religious factions uh, who are arguing and bickering and literally uh, you know, getting in sometimes uh, what were life and death struggles uh, over uh, you know, uh, religious ideas, uh, views about uh, uh, how, you know, in this case, you know, Puritans should act, uh, behave, believe, worship, uh, interpret the Bible, and on and on. And one of the ways I think you can see he was a Puritan's Puritan uh, is that he struggled constantly with his faith, uh, but in a way that made him more moral. Always doing that kind of introspective self-examination, like that guy we saw with his head down in church, uh, praying or thinking, uh, uh, sort of looking deeply into himself, striving to be a better person. Uh, so constant self-examination, uh, self-reflection from Winthrop. How do we know he did that? Because uh, uh, he left a lot of writings and letters that survive as primary source documents. So we kind of can peer into his, uh, you know, uh, his mind and see what he was thinking and saying uh, in his, his life. And if anybody could have gotten away with not being a very good Puritan, uh, you'd think it'd be the governor of the, uh, you know, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is probably true. So uh, I do think it's probably credit to him and shows the appeal, at the time anyway, uh, of uh, Puritanism, uh, that uh, he would take it all so seriously, even though he's got the political power to you know, be able to say, I don't, who cares? You guys can go to church and believe in the religion. Uh, I got you know other things to do, uh, and I can do what I want because I'm the governor. Actually, he couldn't entirely because he had to be elected and re-elected, uh, but... but Nonetheless, uh, it, what I'm saying, I guess, is that it's even, I think, more impressive that he strove to be a good person and a good Puritan when he really ha probably had to be less than anyone else because he was the most powerful person, uh, uh, at least in his colony. The documents also show, and you can't see the bottom of this, I don't know, I cut that off uh, inadvertently, but the documents, his own letters mostly, and his wife's show a truly loving relationship uh, with his wife. Uh, a companionate marriage of, of the kind that we uh, expect uh, and that is the norm today. Uh, and it was the norm among the Puritans, though it wasn't the norm among uh, other societies and uh, even in other colonies at the time. So the Puritans' harsh side. Uh, no doubt they had one. Uh, they're in the Scarlet Letter, uh, if you ever read it or do, in, uh, in movies. In fact, there's a movie version, of course, of the Scarlet Letter, but the Puritans show up in movies, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, and they almost always show up as unforgiving, harsh, you know, at the at the very, you know, best kind of tough love type people. That's at best, uh, you know, kind of their uh, the public or uh, the public image they have today, uh, right, uh, in popular culture. Uh, but there, of course, is some truth to this. Uh, they could be especially by our standards, extremely harsh. We know there was a great deal of social professor, uh, professor pressure to conform, uh, and uh, you know, an inner pressure was taught. 
Uh, so uh, it didn't come from nowhere. This is sort of part of their, you know, social socialization process and their value system. You're supposed to kind of put pressure on yourself to uh, to be a good Christian, uh, to, you know, to be a good Puritan, uh, to be a good person, your family, uh, to the community, uh, at the church, uh, etc. Et Pay your taxes. There's pressure on you to conform, and we tend to see that as a bad thing uh, today. Um, and in some ways it is, but some of, even some of these sort of harsher aspects to the Puritans, you can see uh, uh, that there are positives in that as well. Whether we like the idea of conforming or not, all of us do to some degree, even now in our own society. We're encouraged to be sort of express ourselves and go our own way to things, and that's great. Uh, and I, I'm all for it myself. I know I do. Uh, but we still all have to kind of obey certain, uh, you know, social rules and uh, norms, uh, you know, in order to get through uh, society uh, without, uh, you know, there being just you know, constant, uh, uh, you know, uh, dysfunction in our society. So, uh, but they certainly put, I would say, extra uh, pressure on themselves and each other to conform, uh, much more than we'd be comfortable with today. There was a kind of a, a criminalized morality, as uh, some uh, scholars have put it, harsh pun punishments for crime, uh, and even harsh punishments for moral transgressions that could be tri uh, crimes. So, for instance, adultery uh, was punished. It might be looked down upon today in our society, uh, uh, but it's not punished as a criminal offense. You don't uh, actually you know, get put behind bars for it. But the Puritans did uh, 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 do that. So uh, this is something that really stands out to most people that uh, learn about the Puritans or study them for the first time. Some of you guys are probably studying them for the first time, understandably. That's why you're here. But the, their punishments uh, uh, do uh, stand out to us in a negative way. Uh, witchcraft is something that uh, we associate with New England and the Puritans, correctly. 95% uh, of all witchcraft cases in the colonies were in New England. Uh, and that's because nine, you know New England is uh, you know, filled with Puritans. So it's the Puritans that took witchcraft, uh, you know, more seriously than apparently Anglicans uh, in Virginia, uh, Presbyterians and Baptists and other, other colonies that we'll see because uh, there's a, a Catholics that come to Maryland and other places uh, where you don't see nearly as much concern uh, with uh, uh, witchcraft. Uh, and of course, you know we're heading uh, uh, to looking at the Salem Witch Trials, which is the ultimate example uh, of uh, what we could call witchcraft hysteria uh, in the colonies, uh, which took place in Massachusetts at Salem, hence the name. Uh, the Puritans were quick to criticize uh, rich, poor, uh, and anyone uh, who they believed ungodly. Uh, and so they were intolerant. Uh, meaning they, they weren't uh, uh, tolerant uh, uh, overall of other people's views. They were certain that they were right. Remember, they believed they were God's chosen people. Uh, and if you didn't believe like them, uh, uh, they, they weren't, uh, they, they weren't uh, likely to say, well, you know, uh, I don't agree with your beliefs, but you know, I respect that you have the right to hold them. Uh, that's all true. However, keep in mind that the idea of religious tolerance at all, uh, at least in the Western world, the colonies, the European world, uh, was not non-existent, but it was sort of a small fringe group of kind of intellectuals that were just uh, starting to kind of deal with the idea or uh, uh, push the idea of a religious tolerance. And that was even really kind of at the end of the century, not so much uh, in the first part of the century. So they were intolerant, but what I'm saying is they were kind of like, sadly, the norm. Uh, uh, each group, religious group, was kind of intolerant to the others, uh, vice versa. They were quite exclusive in trying to keep sinners out as church members. I said that you had to kind of pass a, a series of tests. The saints and the ministers of a, a given church would interview you if you're new to the community, you want to become a member you're going to have to give them answers that satisfy them or display through your conduct and behavior as a member of the community 
signs that you're a good Christian and a good person, uh, or you're likely to be uh, shunned as a sinner, uh, maybe be allowed to go to church, but never uh, be allowed to be a saint. So it's pretty exclusive. Uh, and so uh, there could be snobbery and there could be finger pointing, uh, uh, right, by excluding that person and saying that person, you know, that's not a good uh, person, they're a, they're a sinner. Uh, and so there's lots of social pressure uh, applied uh, and kind of like a lot of social discrimination, uh, you know, discrimination against, you know, fellow Puritans, but ones that they just see as backsliding. And we already know they took themselves very seriously, uh, self-righteous, self-important, often contemptuous of authority, uh, they could even be paranoid uh, at certain times. Uh, I mean, of course, individually, there's always a percentage of you know paranoid people in any society, but I mean, collectively, they could sort of uh, become paranoid. They were even encouraged uh, uh, to spy on each other. Uh, the authorities, religious and political authorities, both uh, kind of encouraged people to look in other people's windows. If, if you look at the pattern of settlement uh, in New England towns from this time forward. Uh, uh, and this is true. Uh, the houses are usually very close together in towns and villages. I mean, part of it might have been kind of a feeling of safety and comfort and you know, for coziness if you put everybody close together. But part of it was literally and openly uh, that we want our houses to be together, our buildings close together, so you know, people uh, can be watched over so that, uh, you know, we can sort of cut down on sin uh, with having people know that their neighbors are sort of looking in their windows to see what they're doing. One of the great now deceased scholars uh, on the Puritans, Perry Miller, maybe the greatest ever, uh, said with, a, I think, somewhat of a sense of humor, apparently, because uh, this is true, but it is funny the way he says it, the Puritans knew there were people out there sinning, and it was their job to find them. Uh, so uh, they could be pretty nosy, uh, and uh, you know, lots of uh, judgment, lots of judging sort of your neighbors. Uh, oh, that person isn't a saint, and uh, for good reason, they do this and they don't do that, and a lot of gossiping sort of going on, uh, a lot of social pressure. So just this list alone, and I could go on, certainly paints a, 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 a none too flattering picture of the Puritans, uh, and it's true. Uh, so uh, again, I'm trying to give you not a one-sided look at the Puritans, uh, but kind of a both or all sides uh, look at the Puritans, uh, and this is certainly a legitimate way uh, uh, to view them, uh, at least in, in part.